I think we can get going. I see people are still popping in, but I think they can join once we started. Um, so welcome everyone and welcome to people who've been here before and especially special welcome to everyone who's first time at the Tech Leadership Meetup. Uh, happy to have you. Um, I think I'll just start with uh, some of the house rules, which Benny has been posting in the chat if you want to read them in detail. But just in short, um, please try to keep yourselves muted during the talk uh, so as to not interrupt or the speaker with uh, any background noise that may be where you are. Um, if you do along the talk need to drop off, uh, we completely understand. There may be some pressing issues at home, at work. That's completely fine with us. And as the talk is going, once it's started, um, if you have any questions for the speaker, again, please drop them in the chat. Uh, Benny, Roberto, and myself will ask the speaker the questions uh, towards the end of the talk um, or at the, towards the end of the meetup. Um, so just drop them and we'll keep track of the questions that you have. Um, we will also be recording the actual talk. So just an FYI, so everyone's aware that the talk will be recorded. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of things from um, tech leadership and offers in that I just want to share. So I'm just gonna share my screen quickly. Um, to start with, uh, we're excited to share that we're going to be pushing out a tech leadership newsletter starting this month. So the first, each issue will go out after our meetup. So once a month we'll release a newsletter and what it is is it just contains um, a curated list of uh, content that we've found on the web or we've read on the web over the month that we feel will be interesting and will be great for learning for the tech leadership community. So we'll be pushing out one after this meetup today and it'll, this is a preview of what it actually will look like. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can subscribe. Um, I'll be sending out a link in the chat now with this. It will take you to this page where you can put in your email address and you can subscribe. Um, also, just a reminder that we have a Tech Leadership Twitter space at Tech Leadership X, um, where we share what the next meetup is going to be and what details are around that, but also the, usually a daily link to an article that is also interesting for the Tech Leadership community. So uh, if you're interested in that, please follow our account. And then our speaker today is actually from Office In. Um, we'll, and I'll introduce Stephen just now and what his talk is about. Um, but Office In have also are also going to be offering some a chance for our attendees to win some swag. So if you are part of this event, you you may win some swag, and you just need to fill in the form on this page to enter the competition. I'm going to drop now in the chat. Um, the details so to, to access this form and to get to the newsletter and the Twitter account. So I'll share them now and I'll share them again at the end of the meetup, just so if people missed it now, they will also have access to it. So let me just share that in the chat and then I'll do my introduction for Stephen and the talk for tonight. So those details should be in the chat now. Um, and then for our talk this evening, um, as I mentioned, Stephen from Office End is going to speak to us. Um, I'm just going to read his bio here. Yeah? Um, so since his first job at a small tech startup, Stephen has gained experience across Africa, primarily in building marketplace businesses. He's currently the VP of growth at Office End. Uh, his main focus is on continuously making an increased impact on the global software community. He spends a lot of time thinking and reading about the rising role and responsibility of software engineering in our society and how we can organize ourselves to build a better future. So we're very excited to have him as our speaker at the Tech Leadership Meetup and he today is going to be sharing with us on how to win at hiring in South Africa. So Stephen, I'll hand over to you from here. Thank you, Tanaka. <laughs> a very, uh, very big introduction. I don't know who wrote that, but... Um, 
uh, just manage your expectations, take them down a notch, I think. Okay, um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, the screen I'm going to share is, uh, I just want to find you guys. Alrighty. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks, Tanaka. Thanks for having me. Um, excited about tonight. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. Uh, Josh, who's on our team, is here with us tonight as well. He's our data guru. So, Josh, won't you keep an eye on any like really interesting questions that we can process afterwards? So, we did a bunch of um, data work to create this report, which I'll explain in a bit but we still have a lot of data that we haven't really looked at yet. So if during tonight you're like, hmm, I wonder if they have this, or I wonder um, what the answer to this question would be, please do drop it in the chat. If we don't get to it tonight, um, we can use that for further content that we can create uh, in the upcoming newsletters or to put on the forum. That's just kind of a, um, a, a PSA. And also there's a non-zero uh, chance that the labels or something on the graphs are too small. Um, I'm not that used to presenting them in this format. If that's the case, please just drop it in the chat as well. Uh, and then um, Benny or Tanaka, if you can just shout at me so that I can clarify whatever the situation is. So without further ado, let's jump in. Um, so what are we gonna learn tonight? Basically, we've got this one thing. If you do it, you win at developer hiring. Um, so we'll, we'll discuss that first. And then we'll go through the top five hacks um, that will always, you'll always close a candidate if you use these, these top five hacks. Um, it's basically, it's just like this cheat. And then after that, you'll never believe what happens next. So it's very difficult to know uh, without seeing your faces whether this is landing. So forgive me if it's awkward, but that's not the real agenda. Um, I kind of put that in there because the way uh, an event like this looks is like, oh, cool, I can join this and you know I'm going to win. Um, the real answer, as you'll see tonight, is it's not that simple, um, but hopefully there's some data or some value that we can share with you tonight that puts you on the right track um, or as a community or uh, at least as a forum tonight, we can discuss the things and take the steps towards, um, towards getting there. Um, and towards the end, I'm keen to, to chat through it. So I'll go through who we are as AlphaZen, who I am, and then take you through the report. Cool. So AlphaZen, what do we do? Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the chat. So I'm assuming a lot of people uh, know who we are, um, but just for completeness sake, um, essentially we're a platform where you can hire software developers. It looks like this. Um, you can um, go through the software developers, send them a message and say, hey, I would like to um, talk to you about a job at our company. Um, so we, what do we do? We go out to Google, LinkedIn, we have a blog, we have a podcast, we go to events, we sponsor t-shirts, um, we do a whole bunch of stuff uh, and that generates us a community of, this is a bit of an old slide, over 100,000 software makers. Um, they then apply to OfficeN, we've got about 2,000 of those a month uh, and then we have a curation team that uses past, past platform performance as well as like information on the profiles and curates the software developers um, and lets the ones that are uh, high, high quality, real software developers um, that are high, have a high probability of being placed on the platform, onto the platform. And then they work with someone called the talent advisor who basically helps them get their profile up, uh, manages their salary expectations and all that kind of thing uh, and moves them onto the, onto the platform. Um, so all of that happens and the end result is that little platform uh, picture that you see there. So that's pretty cool. Uh, that's what we do. And on top of that, then we have these um, really expert people um, called account managers. Um, and you'll see why I'm telling you about this in a second. Um, these guys know better than anyone how to help you um, when at hiring. Um, they have all the data that I'm about to show you tonight. They've uh, placed over 100, some of them have placed over 100 people um, each. That's they called it the 100 Club. Very fancy, you get a t-shirt. Um, and they they have this basically insight. This is their day job. Um, so these guys are the best people to help you hire. Um, but you got me tonight. Um, so ideally we would have an account manager, um, but tonight um you got me, but I do not come unarmed. So this is the 
offers a state of the software developer nation survey 2021. It's quite a mouthful, um, but I come bearing this gift. Um, and I've also been involved in the previous report of this, as well as the remote report, which we did in 2020 when things got a bit weird. Um, so I'm hoping to run you through this tonight. Uh, I have basically what the data says, plus a little bit of opinion um, and a, a couple of kind of dots that I've tried to draw and by no means authoritative, um, but hopefully we can have a conversation around them. Why did we make the report? Um, Offerzen's mission is to unlock potential. So um, we do that for candidates by helping them find great, a great job where they can have impact um, in the world. And we do that for companies um, by helping them grow their tech teams. We know that for companies, the number one constraint is your ability to grow your tech team for, for pretty much most companies. And I think that became the biggest constraint over capital a couple of years ago. Um, so for this report, we would like to help both of those sides of the marketplace unlock their potential. Uh, and we want to do that through creating this transparency. Um, so we hope that a software developer can use this aggregated information to know um, how the things that he prioritizes are prioritized in the market at, uh, in general, or for a um, hiring manager to look at what a senior software developer actually means and how, senior, how software developers identify themselves, and then to use that in his conversations of uh, when trying to find a senior software developer or, or someone of a certain seniority. So we believe that transparency and information is empowerment uh, in the space. That's why we do it. Also, because we get invited to sweet meetups like this one. So it's me and 3,500 developers uh, data. So hopefully uh, that's useful. Cool. So jumping in, um, I've basically taken the, the report. So we have two reports. We have um, the, the kind of standard report, and then we have a hiring specific deep dive. I've taken the two. I'll tell you about them right at the end and give you the links uh, and, and kind of try to draw kind of themes between the stuff. And I've also added some random data. So the first theme is that the game you're playing, so if you join this meetup, and you're a tech leader and you're hiring, the game you're playing is the highest stakes game on the planet. This is something I don't think people realize enough. Um, if you really think about it, um, the COVID happened um, and it accelerated something that we, we've all been kind of expecting and waiting for when we talk about, but we talk about it pretty flippantly. So now I don't want to take it a bit ser more seriously. So this is a, from our newsletter earlier this month. Um, this was actual demand activity on an index of previous years. Um, and you can see COVID smashed us in April. Uh, and then it started getting back to normal and then everyone went on holiday. Uh, and then it really started taking off at the beginning of this year. Um, and this February, we've had the highest number of um, companies interviewing uh, through OfficeN we've ever had. So in South Africa, this is picking up um, and we're seeing that as a, as a global phenomenon. So Demand in the local level increasing. Then this is not from our report, um, but if you think about the size of the prize for getting software developers, this is what it looks like. So the market value per employee, if you look at all of these companies, they're largely tech companies. So um, the most valuable companies on the planet are tech companies. The most valuable people on the planet, value creating people, are software developers because they are the constraint for tech companies. You are trying to compete for software developers against these companies. This is the biggest game you can possibly play right now from a value creation um, perspective. So at the beginning when Tanaka was talking about um, my intro, as I spent a lot of time thinking about this, I'm a little bit uh, unhealthily obsessed um, with this problem or um, problem space. Um, so if you get a bit carried away, please forgive me. Cool. So all these tech companies realize that tech is the future and that the future of tech is software developers. So um, the way to get on the top of the S&P list is through the best technology. The way to get through the best technology is by getting the best developers. And they're all thinking like that, whether they're local or they're international. And developers are more in demand than they've ever been. This is the first piece of data you're seeing from um, 
our report. And um, Josh, forgive me, uh, this is from like a very rudimentary word, word cloud, but this is from um, our, one of the questions we asked, what companies would you like to work at? Um, and this is a whole bunch of South African software developers and if you squint your eyes, you'll see that the, the biggest ones, um, there are some good South African companies there, but the biggest ones are not local stars um, like we'd like them to be. They are um, big companies that are competing for our talent. So those, those companies are competing for our talent and our talent is very happy to go there. So we asked the question, would you be interested in working abroad? Um, just checking that that math adds up real quick. Yep. 63% um, of people said they're passively interested. In other words, they would go if the right offer came. 22% are actively looking to work abroad and 15% said no, which is quite a um, scary number. If you think about the fact that you're competing against these guys and our talent is pretty happy to move. Obviously, this doesn't really take into account the, real, the reality that remote has brought upon us in that a lot of these guys can work remotely from anywhere um, and that that passively interested um, bucket is a lot more kind of um, acquirable from uh, overseas. These labels, I'm guessing you won't be able to read, so I'll quickly just kind of highlight them for you. Um, would you why would you consider working abroad? Um, this first category labels for better opportunities for career growth. Um, and this is the first time you'll see that tonight, but not the last time. Um, these are, the second one is earning more money. Then it's personal safety, which in the South African context, you can probably understand. Better companies to work for is the next one. And we're looking at political reasons. Uh, better buying power, which is similar to salary, I suppose. Uh, and then other, and then better weather. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and then more space. Um, but what is what I'd like to highlight is uh, better opportunity for career growth um, because this is the rest of the theme for the evening um, is that if we cannot offer software developers um, better opportunities for growth um, we will not win cool so first section high stakes uh, high stakes game on the planet software has eaten the world it's done um, thanks to COVID um, it helped us along the way it was already being eaten um, but it put it in a blender and gave it a straw. I don't know, sorry about that analogy. Uh, the prize is bigger than ever. Software companies are the most valuable companies in the world. Um, there's more demand for it than ever because probably the prize is bigger um, and a bunch of other things. And you're competing on the global stage against everyone. So, fun times. Now, not only is the stage super competitive, but it's also moving all of the time and also moving super fast. So if we look at, um, these are the two reports, uh, sequential reports that we ran. Uh, the one on the left is, <coughs> excuse me, languages developers want to work with most in 2020 and on the right, 2021. So you'll see that it, for the most part, uh, the differences were not that huge um, in the previous year. But on the right hand side, um, people picking Python um, and that's shooting out way ahead from second place. So we could, you could wonder, okay, maybe we just had a bunch more Python respondents this time. It doesn't seem to be the case. Um, and also as reflected, we did a similar survey in the Netherlands where we're also now active um, and we see a similar trend. So what's happened in the space of a year is a language, um, a year or so, a language is really kind of shot out and everyone's really interested in, in learning this language um, and want to work with this language. And we're seeing that is coupled with um, a rise in interest in AI cloud uh, enterprise infrastructure um, and this kind of move towards machine learning and data. So this move is happening super fast in our industry. Um, and these other um, really important things are also picking up um, insanely fast crypto. Um, I see some of the crypto guys here tonight for school, cybersecurity, these kinds of things. So the space is moving uh, at a rate of knots. Okay, so um, not only is the space moving, but people 
are so you could say like that's cool software developers want to learn python but you know they're not um, this graph shows that people software developers like to learn a new language at a very high frequency so for juniors um, uh, if you look at just the kind of the left hand side of the graph and let me just go here the left hand side of the graph is youngest age and the right hand side is older and then the blue one is every few months um, that people would like to learn a new language orange is once a year and then the light green is once every few years so you can see that on the left hand side juniors are pretty keen on learning a new language every couple of months so when you couple that with everyone who's interested in python it means that people are moving and will be moving super fast um, to learn those new languages i might go that's cool but we you know we're a, a javascript shop um, how does that work and how do we provide that those developers with that opportunity so if we go <clears throat> to the next slide we'll see that one in three developers are looking to move jobs in the next 12 months now we're not sure whether they are looking to move jobs um, necessarily because they want to learn a new language uh, probably not if you if you see the rest of the, the kind of data um, but what this does say is that developers move up often so the opportunity to switch languages does uh, present itself often which means that developers can switch languages often which means that languages can progress super often so not only do you need to compete for software developers but you also need to compete with the overall market trends in languages uh, and where software developers are going so this is quite an interesting thing that the younger software developers obviously learning new new languages older software developers specializing um, and but software developers as a whole uh, moving with relative high frequency so into that section the playing field and software developers move fast so popular languages and industries are shifting fast and developers are naturally inclined to be moving jobs and learning new languages um, if you can imagine in those the, for a junior trying to find what languages and, and the kind of what spaces work for them and the opportunity to move frequently is really good for that um, and because of the high demand and the low supply for software developers that opportunity exists so movement happens a lot Cool. Last um, of the three sections, you only get one shot. And then I added Eminem above my head for fun. Um, cool. So you've got one shot. So it's crazy. You're competing against everyone. Um, things are moving really fast. That doesn't help you. That's just probably made you a bit more nervous. Um, this probably makes you even more nervous is that the bigger the company, the bigger the salary. So uh, if you look at this graph, the green at the top um, is 500 uh, plus people. The purple, which is next, is 200 to 500 people. Then it goes down to 50 to 100. And then it goes down to 11 to 50. And then lastly, 2 to 10. So depending on where you are on the scale, it's pretty difficult to compete with big companies because they pay more. Um, and that's kind of the, the winner's um, the richer get richer and <laughs> they have bigger buying power uh, and they're harder to compete with. So that's another uh, aggravating factor in the competition. So I've been working with this data for quite a while um, and I've come up with this very non-scientific um, uh, summary. Um, so this is by no means authoritative. Um, it's merely, it's like purely just to, to indicate um, how I think about it. Salary is obviously important, but these other two words are just as important. Um, growth, which we'll unpack quite a lot now, uh, and autonomy. <coughs> so when we look at uh, the non-monetary benefits that people weigh up when choosing a job, uh, the number one uh, listed uh, factor is growth opportunities. Uh, and the second is remote work. So when I say autonomy, um, I use it in quite a broad category sense. So remote work is some version of autonomy. There are other like individual mission level autonomy, uh, task based autonomy, that kind of thing. Um, but there's also just the freedom to determine how one works uh, and what one works on. 
um, which is, is part of that. And remote uh, and flexible hours are both one part of those. So if we look at growth opportunities, you can see, if I just, uh, if you look at the colors, the light blue is senior, the middle is intermediate, the orange is intermediate, sorry, and the purple is junior. For growth opportunities, you can see it's quite uh, kind of swayed over to the juniors. So the shape looks like this with the seniors kind of valuing it a little bit less relative to the juniors. If you look at um, the remote work, which is the more autonomy level um, type uh, benefit, you can see this, the, the, um, the sway is the other direction. So seniors relatively favoring that more. And you see the same thing with flexible hours. Um, so that's, that's a pretty interesting thing. From a, so from a senior um, perspective, they're looking at flexible hours and remote work. And then for juniors, relatively more interested in growth opportunities and as well company culture, which is quite an interesting thing. Um, so, so software developers learn to be in the junior stage, really learn, uh, looking to learn um, and looking to do that in a place of learning, high learning culture. Um, whereas later in life, uh, people that are getting older, software developers that are moving kind of forward in their career, valuing a bit more balance. So growth very heavily on the kind of junior side uh, and autonomy on the senior side, but still they come as a combo. Um, you'll see that in a bit. So what does growth actually mean? Um, we asked the question and for, so again, purple junior, um, orange intermediate, the colors are not sequential, sorry. Um, blues, dark blue senior and turquoise take lead. Um, so the number one listed um, point was challenging projects and growth meaning challenging projects. If you are a maker, this would make sense to you. So generally software developers are creatives. They like making things, they like solving problems. So being given stuff to refactor with instructions on how to refactor, it generally doesn't cite, excite uh, software developers. What, what makers are really after is a challenge and challenging projects. Uh, and again, um, that's how people think um, or think the most around like what growth means. Being able to solve difficult problems uh, is, is very much um, around challenging projects. Now, um, you'll see that for the juniors, um, juniors and intermediates, we've got a, a kind of a sway towards mentors and coaching, um, which would make sense as juniors and intermediates are still like in that pursuit of the growth side of the equation. Um, and then an interesting nice spike um, that you see on for tech leads, really caring disproportionately compared to the others, um, more about company growth projections. And as one would split or take that shift over from uh, creating to managing um, and, and starting to work on the team, that makes, I think, a lot of sense uh, as companies or as managers and tech leads start to think more about the success of the company. Cool. Um, so when we start to think about, um, okay, so software developers want growth, why would they not want to take a job? Um, as one would imagine, the number one reason is because of the lack of growth. It seems relatively obvious. Uh, and the number two reason, the lack of flexible or remote work opportunities. So these two, again, remote uh, growth and, and autonomy playing kind of sparring partners at the top. We've got poor cultural fit uh, and poor employee reviews next. And then we have a, an interesting little sway here around undesirable tech stack. So um, seniors on the right-hand side, juniors on the left-hand side, juniors seemingly less um, opinionated on the tech stack, juniors more opinionated, as, sorry, seniors more opinionated on the tech stack. And that would make sense as people senior um, become more senior, they become more specialized uh, and more tech stack specific. Cool. So growth, right? Uh, growth and autonomy. <clears throat> but I think what's important at this point is to say you can't offer people growth, uh, you can't offer new employees uh, growth and autonomy unless you offer your current employees uh, growth and autonomy. So I think it's time to talk a little bit about investing in your current team. Uh, if you think about 
or if you asked software, or when we did ask software developers, how do they assess, assess company cultures um, for potential employers? Um, the number one reason or the number one factor that they listed was speaking to the employees at that business. Uh, and that's a, a quite a telling sign um, that word of mouth is basically one of your strongest marketing tactics that you, you have. Um, the second one here is the interview process. And interestingly, it is senior on the right, junior on the left. It is swayed more towards the seniors. So seniors value the interview process above speaking to employees. Logically, if you think about it, um, for a senior, the interview process is also a peer review process because generally seniors will be the people interviewing seniors. Um, and that's a good way for a software developer, senior software developer to gauge the culture within the software engineering team at that place by talking to other senior software developers and seeing how they interview them. Um, the other elements here are time at the office, uh, the company website. Interestingly, on the company website and on company content, which are here, juniors um, favoring it them more and seniors less. Seniors becoming a little less trusting of the marketing material as they go um, and caring more about the human interactions, uh, the interview process, talking with hiring managers. So that's quite uh, an interesting um, trend. Cool. Um, so when you're investing in your current team, you know that actually making that investment is the most sustainable thing that you can do to grow your tech team. So growing your tech team means adding team members, but it means keeping team members. And if you focus on keeping your team members, um, you've got a much better chance of finding the right people um, through word of mouth uh, and putting out that that kind of um, image or, or that message to market, right? Um, so what are the things that you can do? Um, unsurprisingly, again, um, to keep the people at your, your um, company, growth, autonomy, work-life balance, I mean, company culture. And for me, in this, in this um, scenario, it's really about, are you taking those, those, those first two uh, company culture is, are you taking these first two and giving people and creating people, you can't give people autonomy, you create autonomy for people. If you're creating that autonomy, giving that, them that opportunity to um, have, have their say, right? Um, and in the remote report, um, interesting things around remote work. Um, we found that while remote work is something that people want, remote work is also something that some people really don't want. Um, so if you are looking for a senior software developer and that person is in the really don't want bracket, you can't go, oh, we offered remote work and, you know, it was listed uh, somewhere along the line here as uh, there's no remote work. Um, so we, we did remote work. Everyone's remote now and I don't understand why the person doesn't want it. It's not about giving people remote. It's about giving people the respect and space and the autonomy to, to do what they need. To, get, to take what they need. So for some people, they need an office. You might want to look at a hybrid approach. Um, for other people, they want remote. For some people, they want to work uh, core hours, for other people not. And I think it's really about diving into those. And there's quite a lot of um, content and, and, and information in the data report, previous data reports around that. Cool. Um, so you invest, so at least my take on the data is investing in your team is one thing, and that's really the starting point. Um, charity begins at home. If you haven't sorted that out, start there. And then investing in your candidates. So one in two developers have discontinued a hiring process after a negative interview experience. So even if you've done all the hard work, right, you've, you've like figured out how to make this amazing value prop, you've got a growth a career path, developers can learn new languages, um, they're having so much fun, the culture's great. Um, we're talking to new people about new technologies and we're doing like hack days and everything's going super well. Um, and you've sorted that out and candidates are telling their friends like, oh, you really must come and work with us. It's super fun. Um, you still need to close that person. So generating the interest is just not good enough. Um, people will still drop out of the process once it started. Um, and those negative experiences happen often. So what are those negative experiences um, look like. The number one is being lowballed or pushed to reveal salary. So this is something we is, is close to our hearts at Office N. Um, 
when we launched, so on a presenter send someone an interview request, um, you you put the salary um, upfront um, with that interview request. And a lot of people, especially when we launched in the new markets in the Netherlands, were not excited about um, being able to do that. What we found though is that it's a um, it's a good context and relationship setting exercise to say, look, this is what we expect, this is what we want, and this is an open and transparent start to our engagement. Um, and you can see that not doing that is a really toxic way to approach a relationship. Um, and that's what it is. Um, investing in your candidates is not just um, having a good EVP and having a negotiation with them, it's about having a conversation um, and about assessing each other's fit. And you can't do that if you're holding cards to your chest. Um, similarly, if you're not giving people feedback and, and communicating better than anyone else, um, that person's gonna drop off. So remember, as much as this candidate is in your funnel, you're in his funnel or her funnel as they assess their opportunities. Um, the rest of them uh, over here, so that's the first two is being lowballed. Um, which I think in my mind is just going, look, treat the person with respect and be open and honest and transparent from the beginning, not receiving feedback, communicate very well. Uh, and then the rest of them are uh, irrelevant online assessments, approach for mismatched roles, badly written job descriptions, long delays in the interview process, too many steps in the process, getting spammed by recruiters. So the, these, this whole section here in my mind is can be summarized with just having respect and investing in the candidate. Right? So the candidate is taking their time, um, they are in high demand. Um, and if you are sending them an inappropriate uh, online assessment, or wasting their time with an opportunity which really doesn't fit their skills, um, you're not gonna get uh, very far and you're not gonna get a very good reputation um, within the market. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Cool. So on this section, what's the recap? Number one, it's all about growth um, and autonomy, but mainly growth. Um, so don't think you'll get away with just a pretty EVP page because uh, employer value proposition page. Having a nice page that explains all the stuff you do and has a, a video of your last offsite uh, is just not good enough. So you actively need to invest in your current people, in my mind, first. Um, and you need to offer optionality and autonomy and treat people with trust and, and take that long-term approach to the exercise because it's a long-term game. So when hiring, respect the candidate's time, that makes all the difference in the world, but, and at the same time, move fast because it's a race, right? So as I said, um, the developer has options. Be open and transparent from the start, um, starting with upfront, these are the conditions, uh, what you'll get from a salary perspective, whether it's remote, whether you're expected to be in the office, those kinds of things, just setting super explicit communication from the beginning um, and not acting like it's a test. So um, taking that seriously from the beginning um, seems really important. Communicating better than anyone else. You can have all of these great things and offer growth and all of these nice things, but unless you're explicit and you communicate these things super well, um, it'll go to waste. And then I think the last one that I, which I found interesting is um, seeing senior and or especially senior software developers assessing companies culture and value propositions by spending time with other software developers. Software developers generally don't trust marketing or HR, but they do trust software developers. Software developers generally don't like marketing or HR. Cool. So overall, um, my take on this, and again, um, this is my take, um, is that reach out, great reach out messages, nice career page, solid processes and all that kind of stuff. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. It's table stacks. But that's like saying you've got to have a DB. Sure, you've got to have that. You've got to have a back end and a front end. Um, and you can get, you can make some progress um, with, with just these things. But the real investment, I think, is in, the, in your people um, and investing heavily in their their ability to be autonomous, to make the decisions and to work in a way that suits them because other people are, right? MessageBird, these big Dutch companies, um, they just raised 300, billion, 300 million euro or something crazy. Um, 
they give people all the autonomy in the world, they understand that life happens, they optimize for work-life balance. They're very like they're they're crystal clear on how they give you growth and autonomy. And you need to do that. And they do it for their teams and the people that I know work there say that they do. Um, and that's not that's not an they didn't do that so they could hire well. They did that um because they, they decided to invest in their people. A nice uh, result of that is that they can attract some of the best candidates in the world now. And after all, the investment is worth it. So if you do do that, it's very expensive, obviously, to continuously and spend an insane amount of time and effort and focus on growth and autonomy for your teams. Um, if you get it right, though, um, the, the investment will be worth it. And as you continue to grow your team, um, you can win that prize, which is the top of the S&P um, rating. Cool. So trust me, I'm in marketing, like I said. Um, that's my take on the data. I am in marketing. Um, but a better idea would be to, to speak to your actual account manager, if you have one. I assume uh, most of you do. If you don't, uh, just go to Office and sign up or send me a mail. I can put you in touch with someone. Um, these people have a way more experience in how to hire uh, and to win in hiring than I do. Um, I have the data, which I've shared with you now, and you will have it afterwards as well because you'll be able to download it. Um, and yeah, chat to these guys. They know what they're doing um, way more than I do, at least. So what else can you do if you are keen to take it forward and really invest uh, in, in winning? Uh, you can download the reports. I'll drop them quickly or and or someone from the Offline team, please just drop them in the chat. Uh, you can go there, you can download the reports. And there's also, Josh is in the chat with us. We'll be releasing a bunch of like deep dives over the next couple of weeks and months on this stuff. Uh, so if you want, uh, you can sign up to the newsletter there. In the report, there's also a link to a bunch of stuff on the blog, further reading um, in and around the space, things that you can do to, to win, whether it's hiring remotely or setting candidate expectations, et cetera. And then, as we said earlier, there's a swag um, kind of competition. So scan the QR code, click on the link, do whatever you need to do. Uh, and you can get an offers in T. That's it. Cool. Thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, that was a very clear and simple way to take all that data and uh, present it in a useful way that people can use for, for hiring, which I assume a lot of people are doing, given what you said from the from the February stats of office. <laughs> yeah, seems like it. Um, cool. There's a couple of questions. Roberto, I think you had like quite a few, but what I'll do is I'll let you choose your best one there. And then we can loop into uh, Robin's question. And if there is more time, we can see what other extra yeah. questions get to be asked. So. Roberto, you can just unmute, unmute yourself if you're still on the call and um, I guess ask your one of your questions and we can proceed. Cool, yeah, sorry. I'm spamming the channel with lots of questions. A lot of them are like, hey, do you have data for this and data for this? This is something yeah. that I'm busy working with at the moment. But I think the, yeah. the big question for me was, um, you know, there are places where we've strived to give autonomy and, yeah. and, you know, give them something to sort of buy into and give them growth plans and things like that but still have people leave and so some yeah. of the things that i'm starting to think is that it's around where people's motivations are tied to specific things so if somebody's motivated on growth when they join growth comes from multiple streams so it's, sometimes it is from like you know practicing in technologies that they've never touched from but sometimes it's just like picking up a new domain and yeah. so what ends up happening is once you've figured out that domain and like now it's not challenging anymore eventually that that sort of uh, dip comes in your growth. And then because your motivations are tied to that growth, now, now you're no longer feeling it. And so you sort of leave. So how would you sort of give people that are been in a company for like five or six years as tech spaces like that growth when like they figured out the language and they know the domain? Um, 
I guess that's the tricky bit, right? Like, mm. is it is it even realistic to want to have the average tenure of a dev be more than six years now? Yeah, that's time? what I was gonna say. I'm not I'm not kind of, I'm not 100 percent sure that it is. Um, in in just it's a bit of a cheeky like uh, opt out answer, but I think it's it's down to the invest in the people thing. Um, and if you if you look at um, investing in people and you you really do want them to grow and they are capped by the opportunities at in your workplace then i, th I think you, you kind of got the answer there is that the best thing for them is to actually move um which is not a great there's not a great like kind of promotion for uh, your retention strategy but at least our approach so i don't have the answer i can only tell you our approach our approach is to kind of unconditionally invest in the people and support them if they want to do that, um, or if they are out there uh, looking for that. Um, so what we, would, we would want to try, um, but at the same time, the market moves. Um, and if we, if, if for whatever stake, like scenario, we got stuck on a, a legacy stack or whatever the story is, we would understand that we, we, need, we need to be fair um, with the people that are on the journey with us. And if they, they do want to move, then that's okay. Um, I think that you've been to a Mac day, so you know the the learning the learning zone versus the performance zone. So I think there are there are things that you can do um, where you can reignite people's passion, um, and those are good. Um, they don't solve the problem necessarily, though, right? They're fun and they're transient. Um, so the the my I think my short answer to the, to the very long answer um, would be that I don't think they're there is a, a very good strategy for that other than accepting that it's a reality and building a building a company around that that celebrates people's successes and, and their, their kind of progression and that that means you've got a it's again going back to if you can, if you invest in the people that are are there in front of you it's the most attractive thing um, to potential employees i think very cool yeah i think we're in a tricky fix because as a company we've said we want a goal of the average tenureship of being seven years. And that's just like thrown me into space and you know, thinking like, I've never met a dev be at a place that's been that long. And sometimes if they are, they sort of just become complacent and they're happy with that stability. And that's sort of where their motivations are. It's like, I don't want to risk you know, not having that. And so, um, yeah, for me, it's yeah. like such a challenge. Wow, it's it's a hard one. Yeah, that is, that is. I mean, so the whole beginning part of it is like, you know, things move fast um, and and developers by nature are um, kind of caught in that whirlwind because we have to um, keep up uh, and having a, the data at least says that that's not where the majority of developers are seeing themselves spending seven years at a place, whether it's yeah. the best place on the planet <laughs> or not. It's not, it's not you, it's them. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Roberto. Um, we've got a question from Robin, yeah, which is how, as South African companies paying in rands, do we compete for remote talent when devs can earn more, if not double, for a foreign company? Hello, Rob, by the way, um, wherever you are. Um, good question, hard question. Um, so I don't, I don't have it again, uh, the answer, in my opinion, which I can give you. Um, the, so I'm now in the Netherlands, I'm calling from the Netherlands now, and um, we, there's, there's a point at which people reach a professional and kind of financial um, good enough phase. Um, and they need to optimize for things beyond that. Um, and I think our data says that pretty clearly, that if you look at um, future salary growth, uh, let me just get the right graph for you and I'll share it quick. Um, the thing that people are after is not, they're not going like, hey, I, I need to earn more money, more money, more money. Um, it's, it's more about like, what is the impact that I can make and how can I balance my lifestyle um, with that? So the, the, a lot of the devs here are around uh, the impact um, that they're making on the planet and the mission. Um, you need to pay enough for that person to have this, like the table stakes, um, but you don't need to pay way more. Uh, as long as you are offering that journey on the mission, I think, 
um, and you have both those levels of growth and autonomy. It really helps if you're in Cape Town and you have an office there, especially for the Dutchies. Um, they love to um, go to Cape Town often. Um, but my, yeah, my answer would be to try your best to take these two things super seriously, um, sell the mission super hard um, and keep trying because at the end of the day, that's not what makes developers tick. And if you find the right person, um, they'll do it. Like I think a lot of people here would have taken a salary cut at some point for the right reason. And they will after a certain level. Um, and as we see here, that's not the thing that's the most valued, which is a relief and gives us some glimpse of hope, I suppose. Okay, cool. Thanks, Robin, for the question. Um, and then another one from Daniel here, which is, um, yeah, he says, apologies if it was answered in the report, but what does the growth rate for skill level look like in a uh, small company versus a corporate, I guess, uh, in some sort of objective measure of skill? <laughs> what is an objective measure of skill, Daniel? Money. <laughs> how, do, how do we, so, with this, so we only, I, I mean, um, it's definitely difficult to answer, but uh, <laughs> look, I mean, developers upskill at different like levels and I guess yeah. in a corporate setting you're going to be placed as a junior a lot longer than if you're in a small company so do you yeah. guys have some sort of measure of of skill like increase um well not that I know of Josh do you have any the one Josh while you while you're thinking um the one thing we do look at or have looked at uh, previously is the distribution of ages and uh seniority so what people consider themselves senior i don't know if that answers the question at all but um there may be some difference in so this is the age distribution of seniors and juniors so you can see that junior developers are generally have two years experience an intermediate de developer has four years experience and a senior developer is generally around, peaks at around the six year mark we could split that around the company size um, stuff um, other than that, so the elapsing of time and the, the amount of money people earn are basically, in my mind, the only or the most objective measures we have in the survey. Unless Josh yeah, I think there. I think letting people answer it themselves is a, a great way to see that. Uh, are you then able to send us that result? Yeah, um, I think Josh and I can have a look at it. So we've got a forum. Um, I just I don't know how to. So we've got a forum at community.lovers.com. Um, and we you know, will post some of those questions there. So I don't know to sure. ask if we can put it somewhere. <laughs> um, otherwise, just go to the forum, sign up, and then you'll get a notification. Josh, maybe you and I can have a look at it. Um, and Daniel, I'll ping you. I on ZX Slack like or something. Um, then I can just ping you. It would be cool to get your input as well, um, just on if it answers your question. Because we, we're kind of new at this, this bit of it. So we've been making the reports for a while. Um, but what we really want to get into this year is like asking, answering these kinds of questions and interacting with people and giving you the answers to questions you actually have instead of questions we're guessing you have. So your hope would be great there. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thanks, Daniel. Um, yeah, we're coming up to time. So I'm just going to use the last two minutes to, to wrap up. Um, and just, I guess I'm going to paste in the chat again, those the same links I posted earlier. Um, so the offers and swag, if anyone, uh, is interesting on having a chance at getting that, there will be, you just copy the links and then you can fill in the form and then the link to the tech leadership, Twitter and the newsletter, tech leadership newsletter that will push out later on this evening. But, um, Thanks a lot to Stephen, our speaker for tonight, for all those insights and uh, coming to share all that knowledge with us. Uh, I think it's really been a great talk, uh, slightly different to what we've had before, and that's pretty cool. Um, and thanks a lot to Offers and your company for uh, the swag and uh, gathering all this information. Um, Stephen, our, as tech leadership, we normally give out a gift as a, a book. 
uh, to each speaker, uh, thanks to Matchbox Solutions, which is Benny's company uh, for that. Um, we've got a list of books that are in the tech leadership space, uh, which we'll actually start linking from our website, but we'll send you a link to that, Stephen, and you can pick a book from there and decide what you want and how we, well, how we can send it to you, but we'll be in touch on that. Awesome, thanks um, Tanaka. And th just, just a note from my side, like, Thank you, thank you to you and Benny and uh, Rob as well for you know investing your time in stuff like this. Um, we need more people doing it and consistently doing it, and we know it takes a lot of work. And you don't get much for it, so um, I'm personally very grateful that you guys are consistent and you take your time and you invest in the community. So thank you. Thank you so much for the feedback. Um, cool. I think that should be it. Uh, Rob, Benny, anything else?